Medics here use a simple colour-coded bracelet to identify severely malnourished children. I mean, this child is really looking quite lethargic, so they're in the... Therese Eriksson is a Swedish nurse. Green, is they okay? They're okay. Red, and... they are severely malnourished. But if you look here, yeah. To make it more... Well, that's if really... you have a red one here, then you have a child with these uh, circumstances of the arm. But you will actually get children with an upper arm of that size. Yeah, I will. I will. How many children a day or a week would you estimate approximately that you see in yellow, orange or red now? 50 to 100 maybe. 50 to 100? Yeah, maybe and something like that. week or no, a month? No, just per day. Per day? Yeah, per day. Despite years of international aid, Ethiopia is still threatened by starvation. More than 8 million Ethiopians, mostly children, are now reliant on foreign food handouts. It's really quite upsetting to see desperate faces queuing up for food and for help. The thing that gets me, I suppose, is, is this looks completely chaotic to me and very busy, but they're actually saying this is a very quiet day and a very quiet time. With thousands in this area suffering severe hunger, I met mothers seeking help. People just gave up the will to live because they were so hungry. They've died in great numbers. We can't even bury the dead properly. Corpses have lain in the open for days and days on end. Death is everywhere around us. I don't know what our future will bring. Only God knows what will happen to us. Severely malnourished children admitted to the MSF program are given a high-energy food supplement called Plumpy Nut. So this is a, some sort of peanut-based yes, nutritional yes. food. One sachet equals 500, 500 calories. Looks right, like right. Yeah, peanut butter or something like that. High in calories and very helpful when a child is, is malnourished yes. or severely malnourished. Yes. It uh, sounds like it's a lifesaver. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Many children, though, require more than emergency rations. Do you have many patients in there at the moment? It's around five, six patients. Norwegian doctor Christina Ugovic treats the most acutely ill at MSF's local intensive care unit. This is the room where we keep the most critical ones. Um, this uh, little boy, he came yesterday, he has malaria and anemia. And this little girl, she was admitted today because of dehydration. She has watery diarrhea and vomiting. This is a tiny one. She came with very severe pneumonia. She was breathing 100 times per minute. She was like really breathing fast. This one also, pneumonia, dehydration. This child is very malnourished. Tiny little thing. Has it been difficult working here? Yeah, yeah, of course, and it's, it's, I mean, it's, you, you see really terrible things, and for me, when I'm able to help, it's kind of rewarding, but sometimes you are not, and then it's really sad. Back in Norway, it's very rare that I see children die, but here, like, you lose children, you, yeah. You really try to treat with what you have, but sometimes it's not. You don't manage to 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 rescue them, and and it's hard. It's hard. The obvious cause of famine is a lack of food, but in Ethiopia, it's not that simple. In a nearby market, the stalls look surprisingly well stocked. But the price of food has risen by up to 500% because recent harvests were delayed by late rains. And as a result, the poorest can't afford to feed themselves. Ethiopia is constantly on a knife edge. Even at the best of times, 
Farmers here don't grow enough to feed everyone. So a simple change in weather patterns can threaten millions with hunger. The situation is made worse by the ever-growing population. Since the famine of the mid-1980s, the population of the country has more than doubled and it's still increasing now at more than two million a year. So that's two million more mouths that need to be fed and the country simply can't keep up. It can't provide enough food for all those new hungry stomachs. As we go forward and the population continues to increase, it does make me worry that Ethiopia's biggest tragedies could still lie ahead. The population of Ethiopia is predicted to double again over the next 40 years. And across Africa, there could be a billion more people by 2050. As resources diminish, humans are being forced into more treacherous habitats in an effort to survive. This is Lake Chamo in southern Ethiopia. It's home to one of Africa's deadliest animals. Tanya set off in search of the Nile crocodile. These waters are some of the most crocodile infested in the whole of Africa. I'm hoping to find some crocodiles in what the locals call crocodile market. The banks of Lake Chamo are home to over a thousand Nile crocodiles. They are the largest predators in Africa, growing up to 20 feet from nose to tail. Crocodiles thrive at Lake Chamo because there's plenty of food. But there's competition. Every day, hundreds of fishermen brave the waters to lay their nets. And amazingly, it's the crocodiles that have come off worst from these encounters between man and beast. Back on dry land, I went to meet Asaged Gebre, who has worked with Lake Chamo's crocodiles for 18 years. Right now, the number one enemy of the crocodiles are fishermen who uses fishing nets. Like this? Like this, it's immensely strong. Really? So whenever crocodiles get entangled, they will never uh, escape dead. Even, even this die. guy, I mean, this guy's huge. Yes, it got entangled in fishing net at Lake Jamo and died. Drowned? Drowned, yeah, drowned, they died. It's estimated that 10% of Lake Chamo's crocodiles drown in fishing nets every year. At such a rate, they could soon become extinct here. But they've come up with an unusual way to conserve crocodiles. Oh, look! They're everywhere! Asagid is the manager of Arbor Minch Crocodile Ranch. And it's feeding time. Of this age, we have got 2,228 crocodiles. 2,228? They are three, three years old. Yeah, they are three years old. These guys are only little, but can they still do us serious harm? Yeah, they can. They can. They can. They, but, can. Uh, they can't uh, break your bone, I think. Yeah? But, uh, they, we they are safe up here, aren't we? <laughs> yes. This is primarily a commercial venture. Surprisingly, these crocodiles are reared for their valuable skins. They'll be sold for export as handbags, boots and belts, earning much-needed income. But a few will be lucky. Every five years or so, Asagid releases 500 young crocodiles into the wild. With sad irony, the future of these magnificent beasts may now rely on the followers of fashion prepared to wear crocodile skin.
Our journey down through the Rift Valley continued into northwest Kenya to the Takana region on the border with Sudan. This area is home to the Takana people, nomads who tend their cattle in some of the most extreme conditions on the planet. But their pastoral way of life is under threat. The problem is the changing global climate. There used to be a drought here roughly every 10 years. Now, thanks to climate change, the drought's happening every four years. And this is the result, a dried up riverbed. The search for water has driven many Takana out of the countryside. They've abandoned their nomadic traditions to live in shanty areas on the edge of local towns, like nearby Lokichogio, now home to 35,000 Takana. Peter Ngala is a government health worker. The livelihood of the Turkana people relies on their livestock. So when there is a persistent drought and famine, there is no pasture, there is no water, so they lose a lot of their livestock. And as a measure to, to mitigate, you find they move to towns. The other main reason they move is cattle rustling. So old-fashioned castle rustling? Yeah, almost every household has a gun. And every household? Almost. See that guy? So you can see the, the guy that's carrying a, a, yeah. a Kalashnikov. Uh, that is meant to provide security for his cows. Right. Yeah, and to provide security for... So he's a shepherd with a Kalashnikov. That is true, that is true. Towns like Lokichogio are growing. 500,000 Takana live in this region. But now 60% of them have sought refuge in places like this. I drove out of town to visit an Adaka, a Takana community who are still living in the desert. It was a four-hour drive into the middle of nowhere. This is a dangerous place. In the last year, 400 Takana have been killed out here in tribal battles. come out to a very remote Takana community uh, to try and meet up with them and they're somewhere over there and we've had to send a local chief to warn them that we're coming and we don't want to surprise them partly because they all seem to have guns So these are the men of the community. I'm just going to go and say hello. Ijoka. <laughs> we do the full one. Okay. Ijoka. Ijoka. How are you suffering as a result of the climate changing and it getting hotter here? Our world has changed. When I was growing up, there used to be plenty of rain and pasture for our livestock. I want you to tell the world that now we are dying of thirst. We're starving. Look at us. We're emaciated. And soon we will die of hunger. As a result of the drought, Violence between tribes across the region has intensified. Adakas like this one have become targets for heavily armed cattle rustlers. Our main enemy is the Taposa tribe from Sudan. They steal our livestock and they've killed many of our people. This enemy will finish us. <laughs> This is a reservoir built by the charity Amref. It offers some hope of salvation for the Takana still living here. But as the only major source of water for miles around, it's become a focus for cattle rustling. <laughs> 